We'll proceed now then, members of the media, thank you for joining us and panelists as well. Thank you for joining us today for this West End infrastructure update on Zoom. Today, Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins and University President Dr. Robert Gordon have joined us. Before we begin, Mayor Dilkins and President Gordon would like to share a few words on the tragedy that occurred in the City of London. Please go ahead, Mayor. Well, thank you very much, Dana. And before we begin this important press conference, let's uh, take a moment just to reflect on the difficult uh, and, and quite frankly, outrageous and tragic situation uh, that I think has impacted us all in a different way that we've seen happen uh, just uh, two hours up the 401 in the city of London. Uh, and it's uh, a senseless tragedy that certainly has impacted a, a great number of lives uh, and one family in particular. And I think any of us who are parents certainly can appreciate that there is a, a nine-year-old boy uh, fighting for his life who will uh, hopefully wake up and realize that uh, he, he no longer has parents. And that is a, uh, a tragedy that is almost inexplicable. And I have reached out to the mayor of London on behalf of our city to offer condolences. We've spoken to the uh, local Islamic association to offer condolences. Uh, and all of us are just reeling here thinking about, you know, how close that is to home uh, and something like that. You know, people are asking, could that happen here? Uh, and, you know, the goal is uh, really to help continue to educate people. And I, I think of the Windsor Works program and, and the conversations that President Gordon and I have had talking about education being at the center. Uh, and I would just ask everyone today to uh, educate yourself, uh, educate your family on different cultures, on different religions, develop an understanding, uh, because through that understanding and that appreciation, you will develop a respect uh, for what it means to live in one of Canada's most diverse cities uh, like our own, but also the value of being a Canadian uh, and, and how we can celebrate one another's faith and diversity together in a respectful way, uh, which is so much which you see so many people doing each and every day here. Thank you for that. Uh, the journey is not done. Let's continue to educate, to develop the understanding and create further respect. And certainly on behalf of the entire city of Windsor, uh, I offer our condolences to that family uh, in London and the entire London community for the senseless tragedy that occurred there just the other day. President Gordon. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Dilkins. Uh, and I echo uh, your comments as well. The University of Windsor uh, community is appalled and horrified by news of yesterday's fatal attacks on four members of uh, London, Ontario's Muslim community. Our hearts and, and very uh, deepest sympathies are with the family and friends uh, of uh, those who were killed and injured in uh, this heinous act of racist terror. Uh, we will continue to stand by members of our Muslim community and all others who are targets of hatred, violence, and racism as well. Thank you very much for those remarks. We'll now continue with the Zoom announcement. We are joined today by Councillor Fabio Costante, representing Windsor's Ward 2, Mike Havey, Director of Athletics and Recreational Services at the University of Windsor, Ray Mansur, the City of Windsor's Corporate Lead for Parks and Recreation, Culture and Facilities, and Jen Knight, Executive Director, Recreation and Culture with the City of Windsor. You're joined by representatives from our local media, and Mayor Dilkins and Dr. Gordon will provide some introductory remarks momentarily, followed by a presentation from today's panelists. We'll conclude with questions from the media. Panelists, please ensure that your camera is turned on for the entire session, but only use your microphone when speaking. Media members, please use the chat function in Zoom to request a question, and once the presentation has wrapped up, media members will be called on to ask questions, and your microphone will be enabled then. Thank you for your attendance today. I'll turn things over to Mayor Dilkins to start us off now. Please go ahead, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Dana, and good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be able to talk about the future of our West End recreation infrastructure as the City of Windsor and the University of Windsor announced this tentative deal to renew and renovate our community spaces. Now, the university has come to the table with very favorable terms that create a partnership with the City of Windsor to expand access to aquatic infrastructure in the West End through the construction of a new pool at the Lancer Sport and Recreation Center. Parking will be free for City of Windsor users. The fees will be the same, and all of the services currently offered by the city will be accommodated. All of this will occur at a brand new pool facility about a kilometer away from 80 Knox. In exchange, the City of Windsor is asked to make an upfront capital contribution as well as small annual payments going forward. This deal, of course, is subject to council approval, but it represents a win for City of Windsor residents, a new pool and lower operating costs for the city. 
On its own, the terms of the deal represent a major benefit for West End residents. However, we know that 80 Knox is a special place for so many area families. And that's why the overall vision must include a major renovation and reimagining of 80 Knox for the next generation of users. The city has focused on building for the future and major investments in the West End amenities is a big part of that plan. Within the last year, City Council approved the exciting vision for the Gray site led by Fairmount Properties, and we approved a new University Avenue and Wyandotte Street West Community Improvement Plan. We're continuing with the University Avenue environmental assessment to rebuild this important roadway, which acts as a gateway to the West End. And as we plan the mix of recreation amenities at 80 Knox, we must plan for the influx of residents that these investments will bring. And that's why I'm proud of the vision that we're bringing forward, a $42 million investment at 80 Knox, rebuilding, improving, and expanding this facility for the next generation of users. The federal government has launched a new green and inclusive community building fund, which is specifically focused on supporting underserviced communities. The city of Windsor is preparing an application that would seek the maximum contribution of 13.5 million from this grant to help fund the estimated 42 million to upgrade 80 Knox Herman Recreation Center. Now, let me be absolutely clear. We need to undertake this investment in West End infrastructure, and I am committed to getting this $42 million renovation to 80 Knox completed, regardless of the success of our application to the federal government's program. Funding support from Ottawa would mean that this investment in 80 Knox would happen sooner. And if we don't succeed, then we may need to phase the construction over time, but it will just be a matter of time before this upgrade occurs. So now is the time for the public to provide feedback to help us determine what mix of amenities should be included in this reimagined complex. Our timeline is tight, but it is driven by the very short notice regarding the federal funding intake. Our team is committed to submitting the best possible application and putting our best foot forward. And I hope that all community members are excited about the vision that is being unveiled today, and especially the partnership with the University of Windsor. There's an opportunity here to build our community up in a really fantastic and creative way. And when thinking about this overall investment, I urge folks to think about the community wide impact. The, Lens the Lancer Center plus a renovated 80 Knox represents a huge expansion of recreation infrastructure in the city of Windsor's West End. This is an investment in West End in individuals and families and students, businesses and community groups that will have a positive impact across the entire city. Today, we are presenting a vision that will need public input and council approval. And I'm hopeful that in the weeks ahead, we can have the detailed conversations that make sure that all questions are answered and build a true grassroots vision for what the new 80 Knox Herman Recre Recreation Complex should look like for the future. Dana? Thank you, Mayor Dilkins. Next up, we'll hear from University of Windsor President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Gordon. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dana and Mayor Dilkins. Uh, and unfortunately, I have to leave shortly, but I'm certainly happy to be here today to really highlight um, our, our commitment to uh, working with the city of uh, Windsor. The University of Windsor is committed to working more closely with the city than ever before in supporting our future prosperity. Uh, this includes a strong alignment with the city uh, towards the Windsor Works Economic Revitalization Strategy we are also committed to developing future programming that is responsive to community needs and priorities for youth, adults, and seniors, especially when it provides opportunities for our students to the University of Windsor to grow uh, as community leaders. Uh, we are in the process of embarking here at the University of Windsor on a new strategic plan over the next year. A key pillar of this will include enhancing our community engagement efforts that involve working, work integrated learning and supporting programs that the community truly needs. I, I've had the recent opportunity to discuss um, certainly uh, these opportunities with the mayor and many city councillors about ways in which we can effectively build new and impactful partnership opportunities throughout the city, including those on the West End. Our vision for the new $73 million um, Lancer Center as part, uh, as, as part of, a, of this commitment will be as a strong community hub with the goal of delivering programs there and through the uh, refurbished AD Knox uh, complex that are impactful and build on our local, uh, local capacity. Uh, and so uh, really thrilled to be, be here today and certainly looking forward to really being a strong partner for the city as we move forward. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. 
Please welcome now Mike Havey, the Director of Athletics and Recreational Services at the University of Windsor, and Ray Mansour, the City of Windsor's Corporate Lead for Parks, Recreation, Culture and Facilities. They're joined by Jen Knights, the City's Executive Director of Recreation and Culture. I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Dana. Um, of course, the focus here today is uh, to have a discussion about the, uh, the, the tentative uh, agreement about the pool, but I, I did want to take a moment to provide some familiarity with the Lancer Center project uh, overall and let you know what those program elements are before we get into a specific discussion about the pool. So, uh, Dana, if you could pop up the slide, uh, the one that follows the Lancer Center. So, you know, this is a, this is a, a very bold and ambitious uh, project. It represents more than 110,000, nearly 120,000 square feet of new indoor space. It adjoins the existing St. Dennis Center uh, at the south and continues south towards the Assumption High School property. Uh, the main program elements of, of, the, uh, of the Blancher Center include a triple gymnasium uh, with seating for 200 for 2000. Uh, that triple gymnasium includes a suspended three lane recreational jogging track. Of course, uh, there's also a pool. So there's an eight lane, 25 meter community pool. Uh, there's a double height fitness center with state-of-the-art equipment, three new multi-purpose rooms and new change facilities, both for varsity teams and a separate public locker room that serves not only the pool, but the rest of the facility. So next slide, Dana. So just to provide you some orientation to the site, um, 11, of course, is the existing Dennis Farrell field house. The arrow at the bottom of the screen shows a new entrance into the facility and, and areas one and two are the Lancer Commons space, which joins the new space to the old space. Three and four represent the double height fitness center uh, that's glass encased uh, and will be filled with state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, five, five, and five are three new multi-purpose rooms on the second level. Uh, six is the new uh, 25 meter eight lane pool and seven is the triple gymnasium and it's shown with the roof cut away in competition format. So this is the view of the building as you would come in the new main entrance. You can see that uh, there's a dramatic uh, prow feature that beckons people from College Avenue to come to the new uh, main entrance and uh, you can see that the double height fitness facility is quite prominent with its glass uh, curtain wall. Now you've entered the building and you're in the Lancer Commons, the lobby area looking south. Uh, the fitness facility is on the left. You can see in the center of the image, the hallway that would take you down to the gymnasium, the pool and the change rooms. There's a stairs that takes you up to the multi-purpose rooms on the second level. Uh, and you can see that there's ample seating area for social activity, for gathering, and also a food outlet. So it will truly be a place, uh, a hub of activity where students and community members can gather either before or after uh, workouts or, or events. Uh, this is a, a rendering of the inside of the fitness center. So you can see there's a cardio mezzanine on the second floor level, and then uh, strength and conditioning equipment dispersed on the main floor. Uh, there's a couple of views here of the triple gymnasium. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, there are 2000 seats. So this shows the gym uh, with the seats retracted uh, and is from the second level jogging track that encircles the facility. The next slide uh, shows from the floor level uh, in competition uh, with the, obviously with the seats uh, extended. Uh, there's a prominent alumni lounge and there are production areas there for local cable television and for webcasting. The pool, so a little more detail here. So this, this shows a view of the pool from the shallow end. Uh, it is a glass encased uh, space on three sides. Uh, so it's very open and welcoming. Uh, it includes eight lanes, uh, it's 25 meters. Uh, it is accessible in the shallow end of the pool by either a zero entry ramp or stairs. Uh, there's an on, on deck spectator viewing area. So for you're dropping off your child for swim lessons and you're a parent, 
you can uh, enter the facility in the viewing area and, and watch the swim lessons in progress. Uh, there's also access to all three change rooms from this space. So there's a men's room, a women's room, and a universal or a family change room. And it's designed to support a variety of program offerings. So lane swim, lap swim, recreational swimming, aqua fitness, swimming lessons. It's not designed specifically to be uh, a competition facility, but you will see that there are starting blocks mounted in each lane. And so it could certainly be a training facility for local swim clubs uh, and or uh, in the future, perhaps a University of Windsor swim team. So it's designed to support a variety of program offerings to engage our entire community, uh, as well as Uni University of Windsor students, staff and faculty. The one thing that I will, uh, and I, I know that Ray and Jen are gonna to speak to this as well, Though it is encased case by glass on three sides, there is a motorized blind system that allows it to be turned into a private space when it's appropriate to do so. And, you know, in terms of this agreement, we're close. We're in the neighborhood. The University of Windsor is part of the West End and we're only 1.5 kilometers from the current 80 Knox Herman site. Uh, the University of Windsor has had, I think, a, a long tradition of a wide gateway uh, with the community of Windsor. Uh, and, and I think this is evidenced in our current instructional programs. I mean, we have 750 instructional and fitness classes per year that are open not just to the university community, but to the community at large. Uh, we annually invite 2,000 participants in winter summer camps to enjoy our facilities during the summer. Uh, I look forward to the day when we'll be able to do that again. Um, and you know, we, we are embedded in the community. We have 145,000 University of Windsor alumni around the globe, and many of them reside and, and live and work here in the city of Windsor. And, and I guess the last thing that I'll say before I throw it to, uh, to Jen and Ray to speak in more detail about the agreement is that you know, this idea of a community use agreement is not new to us. Uh, you know, in 1981, the current St. Dennis Center facility was developed as, as, as part of a, an agreement that involved four partners. It involved the city of Windsor, uh, Essex County, the province of Ontario, and the University of Windsor. And that agreement persisted for 30 years. Now, the agreement has expired, but what has persisted is, is this, this culture uh, of accommodation and engagement at, with the city of Windsor and our community. Uh, and, and that's something that has persisted today. And when you look at the multiple events that are hosted at the current facilities that involve community partners, clubs, local sport and recreation activities, um, you know, this is embedded in our DNA as an institution. And with this agreement, we have a chance to build on this. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Mike. Go ahead, Ray. And next slide, please, Dana. So before I begin, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Mike Havey and his team because the negotiations with the university, um, it was evident right from the start when we started negotiating over a year ago that they wanted to get a deal done. They were in the mid, they had construction designs completed and they, when we started negotiating, they went back and adjusted the configuration of their pool to be able to accommodate uh, you know, the majority of our programming, over 93% of our programming. So, uh, so thank you, Mike. So the, the highlights of the deal, as mentioned by the mayor earlier, 93% um, of all of our bookings at 80 Knox will be able to be accommodated at the new pool at the university. And the other 7%, we can also, um, we'll be able to offer them at the aquatic center downtown. Now, uh, for the majority of those bookings, there will be at the exact same time that users are used to having the programs at 80 Knox. Um, as well, users, when we've spoken to them about, uh, you know, a new pool, their big, big concern was to have free parking. And we were able to negotiate that as part of this deal. And the other concern was, well, what would we have to pay if we went to a new facility? And we were able to negotiate that the university will charge the same user fees as we charge at, at the city. So we've been able to negotiate uh, all the terms and conditions that all of our users at 80 Knox currently enjoy to be able to be uh, passed on uh, you know, at the university. Now, subject to council's approval, 
uh, uh, this agreement you know, will be brought forward for council approval on June 21st. However, uh, we also want to highlight that existing memberships will also be able to be used at all city facilities as well as the university. So, so once again, thanks, Mike. Next slide, Dana, and I'll let Jen uh, talk about the tour. Thanks, Ray. And we thought we'd build on what Mike presented to us and it's a, in the midst of construction photo, but we certainly know specifically with aquatic users that there are a number of different things they look for when visiting an aquatic facility and certainly having access to um, bright and spacious change room facilities is one of them. And certainly at the Lancer Center, having public locker rooms or change rooms in addition to one specifically for varsity or just a bonus because it will allow folks to be able to attend and, and go through the change rooms uh, on their way to enjoy the fantastic pool facility. I'll have you go to the next slide, Dana, please. So just taking a look at the new pool um, at the Lancer Center in comparison with our pool at 80 Knox, um, the surface area or the size of each facility is comparable with the Lancer pool being slightly larger. As Ray already mentioned, and you know, thanks to the group at the university, um, we were able to um, have them take a peek at the pool depth and ensure that the, the shallow end depth is conducive to not only our Learn to Swim programs, but also for those folks who attend the very popular shallow aquifer classes at 80 Knox. Um, once you get too much deeper than 1.14 meters, it becomes a challenge for people to enjoy the classes comfortably. And that was something we were really pleased to be able to chat with the university and, and they made those adjustments. The deep end depth, while well, 80 Knox has a dive well, the Lancer pool does not, but as Mike mentioned, is an appropriate training facility for um, swim clubs and swim teams. And then with the pool temperature, generally in training facilities, the pool temperature is kept between 81 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we've chatted with the folks at the university and we've come up with 84 to 85 degrees, which is very similar in temperature to 80 Knox pool. And then knowing that we have a lot of people um, who are looking to make sure it's as accessible as possible for their program needs and absolutely wanting to make sure that the community is able to participate. Um, the university pool not only has ladders like Mike mentioned and, and a ramp, but will also feature a pool lift, which is very similar to what we currently have at 80 Knox. Next slide, please, Dana. Additional Lancer pool features. Um, again, because of the design of the pool, the shallow end space can accommodate up to approximately 48 aqua fitness participants. And for people that attend 80 Knox on a regular basis, um, we, we do see class sizes ranging between 20 and 30 participants at times. So certainly ample space, not only for the 80 Knox community, but certainly the student staff and faculty at the university. As well, there's a nice big deep, deeper area, which again is uh, extremely conducive to deep aqua fit. And as Mike already mentioned, um, the automated window treatment systems are, are, are wonderful addition to aquatic facilities because not only do they allow light to come in and make it a nice bright welcoming space for the people that are using the pool, but it also allows for specialty programming or private rentals where people might wanna have the area to themselves and create a private environment. Next slide, Dana. As Mike mentioned, there's on-deck seating for parents of younger program participants, which is a bonus for people who like to stay close and watch their child progress through lessons. And on the programming end of things, um, the university offers the same learn to swim and aquatic leadership programming as we do, offered through the Life Saving Society. They also mirror the same registration software that we use, so the Active Net system, which again has online portals as well as in-person capabilities. And there'll be lots of accessible parking um, and in chatting with the team at the university, um, it's adjacent to the facility and there'll be um, lots of space for people in close proximity um, to be able to park and then get into the building and get to the programs that they're gonna be enjoying. Um, in addition, there's a drop-off area, which again, uh, for older participants, perhaps the youth taking leadership programs Great for mom or dad to be able to drop them off and pick them up when their, their bronze medallion or bronze cross class is done. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn things back over to Ray to give you a bit more detail on the Green and Inclusive Community Building Grant. Thanks, Jen. So this grant is the main reason for expediting this project. 
we have an exciting opportunity to receive up to $13.5 million in federal funding towards the Aiding Ox expansion project. The deadline for the grant is July 6th, and our consultant has worked diligently to incorporate the grant requirements to give us the best opportunity to be successful in receiving this green and inclusive community grant, uh, which um, Aiding Ox is a prime candidate for. Next slide, Dana. So what does this new reimagined Aiding Ox complex include? It includes a new full-size gym, four program rooms, an indoor walking track, um, program rooms that can be used for art rooms, makerspace, music room, synergies with nearby arts and culture facilities uh, that we will be seeking feedback from the public to get their opinion. Next slide. Also indoors, it would include a brand new fitness center, a commercial kitchen, which we, we uh, teach uh, a lot of our program classes teach uh, cooking. So it'll be ideal for that. Dance studios, which, you know, dance is one of our most popular uh, programs. Or, you know, the rooms, uh, we have space to be able to have a black box theater or a tech space. We want this new community hub to be innovative. Um, and it will be a hub lounge with a lot of seating throughout the entire facility. Next slide, please. As well, not just indoors, outdoors, this new complex would include a basketball court outdoors, tennis slash pickleball courts, uh, at least two of them, a new splash pad, and a soft service playground with a shaded area. As well, we've also incorporated, as another provisional item, an outdoor walking track. Next slide. Okay, and, and that's just a picture of a potential look that we could have at Forest Bay. So I'll turn things over to Councillor Costante at this time. Thanks, Ray, and thanks everyone for being here this afternoon. Uh, as Ward Councillor, I'm certainly committed to ensuring that we bring together community groups, neighborhood associations, and residents uh, who rely on AD Knox for their daily use. My ward is exceptionally diverse, and it includes many working families, new Canadians, post-secondary students, and of course, seniors. And as a result of our collective history and, and passion for AD Knox, I know that many residents may have a lot of questions uh, and insight and ideas about this plan. And I look forward to working with uh, the residents to understand concerns, ideas, as we engage in meaningful consultations uh, over these next few weeks. Uh, I know many will see this $42 million investment in AD Knox as a once in a lifetime, a once in a lifetime investment in our neighborhood to meet the needs of our entire community in the 21st century. I'm pleased to hear from Mayor Dilkins that he's committed to seeing this project become a reality regardless of the federal contribution that may or may not uh, come about through the Green Infrastructure Fund. And as a three-time alumni of the university, I've spent my entire 20s uh, as a student at the university, uh, most recently as a sectional, sessional uh, instructor and um, involved with Enactus on, at the Odette School of Business. Uh, I'm very well aware of the, the community spirit uh, inside the campus and outside. Uh, and I applaud the leadership both at the university uh, and uh, at the city for coming together and finding solutions to better serve our community. And I am very hopeful as mentioned by Dr. Gordon and, and the mayor, that this is the, the beginning of, a, of an even more integrated partnership between the city and the university in serving not just our community, but our entire city. So since being elected on council, uh, it has been uh, no surprise to many that I've been fighting for more amenities uh, in the West End. And in fact, uh, I campaigned on uh, bringing amenities to the West End like a robust community center. Uh, I want to applaud the advocacy of many community residents uh, and groups who have also uh, advocated for more amenities in the community. Uh, and surely I'm going to be spending the next few weeks uh, making sure that as many of my constituents as possible have their voices heard as part of this public input process. I can't emphasize enough the importance of public consultation uh, in these coming weeks as we work collaboratively to champion expanding access and positive investment in the West End that meets the needs of our growing uh, and diverse community. And on the slide that, that uh, we just had up was a, a survey that will be disseminated to the community uh, and there will be much opportunity 
to uh, to have good conversations in the coming weeks. So thank you. Thank you very much, there's, Councillor. There's a link. And and there it is. I just put it right back up on the screen. The survey link there. You'll see. Looking for feedback by June fifteenth. Report to Council will be applied on June twenty first. Thank you very much, Councillor panelists. We're now going to turn things over to members of the media. Media members, if you have a question, please go ahead and use the raise hand function and we will call on you at that time. We already have a few questions coming in. The first is from Michelle Molesky, CTV Windsor. Michelle, please go ahead and enable your microphone. Hey guys, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, in the news release, it says the city will give um, an upfront amount of money uh, to the university. I'm wondering about that. I'm also wondering what the yearly operating subsidy will be. Ray, do you wanna take that? Absolutely. So uh, we're excited to announce that uh, the city will be um, saving approximately $5 million over the next 20 years of capital uh, requirements if uh, you know uh, the university deal is accepted. In, in exchange for the terms and conditions, we would be giving the university $3 million um, cap uh, one-time funding as well. We would be giving them $200,000 annually. However, the new operating structure would result in a savings of approximately $373,000 annually um, if AD Knox is operated without a pool and a new community center. Therefore, the net savings to the taxpayer would be an additional uh, approximately $173,000 annually. Follow up or okay. extra comments? Uh, yeah, I just have one other one. Thanks, Dana. Um, the rink at 80 Knox Arena is a, is a point of interest for many people. If I read that diagram correctly, is it's in gray. Does that mean it's going to get renovations and or I'm sure lots of people want to know whether or not the city's committed to keeping a rink at 80 Knox? Yeah, we absolutely are committed to keeping the rink there. And, and Ray, if you want to chat about it, this is not a removal of the rink at 80 Knox. That's correct. As part of the recreation master plan, which was approved in December 2019, uh, council made it very clear that the ice rink would remain as part of 80 Knox. Thanks for your question, Michelle. Next, we'll hear from Brian Cross. Brian, please go ahead, enable your microphone. Uh, yeah, can you speak to the the one thing that appears to be absent? And I remember uh, recreational swims with my kids, with them really liking the diving board and the rope and all that. Is that gone under this scenario? Thank I you. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, the the facility does not include a diving well. Um, I mean, the deep end is is uh, deep enough for head first entries off of starting blocks and for instructional head first entries, but it does not include a diving well. And just to follow up a little bit on that, um, when 80 Knox Pool was constructed back in 1970, dive wells were something that were quite popular. And through the years, um, while diving boards are still something of interest, um, they, uh, they, they have evolved a little bit. Um, 80 Knox, um, uh, originally had two diving boards and now has the one. Um, certainly for people interested in diving, we have the aquatic center, which is in close proximity. And there are opportunities there for us to expand programming for, for diving should people be looking um, for that as part of their family activities. Follow up? Uh, yeah, this is uh, to Fabio. Um, in the past, there's been vehement opposition to getting rid of the pool at 80 Knox. What's your impression? How are people going to receive this um, latest idea? Yeah, good. Good. Thanks for the question, Brian. I, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a history of uh, uh, on this file and uh, uh, as recent as 2019, Council debated uh, the, the repurposing of 80 Knox. And at that time, that, that um, uh, reimagined 80 Knox was in my view, a fraction of what um, of what we're seeing today, uh, we learned uh, in today's presentation that 93% of the the programming will be uh, the exact same, same time, same programming, uh, and that uh, on-site parking will be free for for residents in the city. Uh, and so, uh, a big part of today and in the coming weeks, uh, and something that I've I've emphasized for 
for as long as I've been a counselor is that we meaningfully engage the community and find out, uh, you know, what their concerns are, what their ideas are around this plan. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to those discussions. Uh, but, but the plan before us today is markedly different than what we saw in 2019 and what we saw in the last two terms of, of council. Thanks for the question, Brian. We're going back to Michelle Molesky. Michelle, go ahead, enable your microphone again. Okay, thanks for taking my question again. Just looking for timelines, which I acknowledge isn't a fair question because we're still in a pandemic. When will the Hern, uh, 80 Knox pool close? When will folks be able to go to the new one at the university? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Michelle. So first of all, um, just to, to clarify, we have reached a tentative agreement with the university. It will go to council on June 21st for them to uh, debate it and uh, if they wish for us to proceed in that manner. After that, we will be waiting for the timelines to determine if we are successful in receiving the grant. We don't have an exact timeline uh, on when the grant, uh, when we would be notified if we are successful, but we're hopeful you know, prior to the end of the year, we would have some kind of direction and we would return to council with the funding sources, depending on how much is received from the grant. So um, I would say it's at least a, a year away, uh, most likely, uh, but however, we would it's all based on when we would receive confirmation from the grant. Follow up. Thank you. In, in fairness to Michelle and, and Mike, maybe you want to speak to this. I mean, we would not intend on having a gap. So if, if the university is scheduled to open in and around May of next year, we're not going to just close the pool. We're going to make sure we time it so that there's a transition of service delivery. Yeah, if I could, if I could speak and follow up to that. Yes, I mean, the, the projected completion date is, is May of 2022. Um, but of course, it, it's going to take us, uh, you know, we will have to transition uh, you know, the application and the registration process in, into our systems. Uh, we'll need to train up our staff and get ready to begin the delivery of, of, of the 93% of the programs that we're offering. So, uh, you know, hopefully that could all be uh, facilitated fairly quickly after any decision from, from the city. So I guess the, the, the quick answer, Michelle, is that we'll be ready uh, when the city is ready. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Michelle. Next, we'll go back to Brian Cross. Brian, go ahead, enable your microphone. Um, yeah, I just wanna want you to speak to this. Um, I think some people in the West End would see this as sort of the, the third in the succession of efforts to close the pool. Um, can you sort of speak to what, what that pool needs to keep it going and why, why there's a, a, an interest to close that pool? And so you, as you guys are turning your mics on, let me just say that the distinction here is that this is not closing the pool and, and getting out of the aquatics business. This is rationalizing the service delivery. So we have, you know, the area's biggest aquatic facility right downtown, and we have this brand new 25 meter pool. We have the 80 Knox pool in Ward 2, and now we have this new pool, 25 meter being built also in Ward 2. Uh, and so this is actually providing better service for the residents and the university. The exciting part of this is the university has come on board and said, we will make sure the temperature is the same. We'll make sure the pricing is the same. We'll make sure that they get free parking. They've, they've taken care of the concerns that were expressed early on uh, with respect to the, the differences, the major differences that they perceive to be uh, problematic. So they've been great partners working through this, which I sincerely appreciate. Uh, and, and so, you know, now this is also the whole reimagining of 80 Knox to make it a, a full community center. But Ray, Jen, talk about the, the problems that we have with uh, the old pool at 80 Knox. Thank you, Mayor Dilkins. Um, to expand on the comments that the mayor has made, um, 80 Knox, as I mentioned earlier, was built in 1970. Um, and it's been a very sturdy, well-built pool over the years. Um, there are some things that do need immediate attention, certainly within the next five years, that would include, include the HVAC system, so the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Um, the pool filters and pumps also require replacement as they're at the end of their life cycle. Um, there are some uh, issues um, in the pool tank itself and with the deck, so some work needs to be done with the pool tiles and the pool decking. Um, we need some upgrades in the mechanical room that services the pool to make sure that it meets current regulatory compliance and codes. 
Um, and so those are some of the, the bigger items um, in addition to some aesthetic recommendations that we would have, um, you know, that need to be addressed sooner rather than later, because um, again, it's a pool that's been around for quite some time and has uh, served the community well, um, but it's definitely in need of some immediate attention for safety reasons. Follow up? Um, no, that's good, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Brian. The next question comes from Maureen Rive, Blackburn News. Maureen, go ahead and enable your microphone. Hi, uh, I'm just wondering, is the tentative agreement with the university contingent on the funding or would you um, make this agreement and then wait for the funding from the, from the government? No, we can we can make the agreement with the university because that pool is going to open and we still think it makes a lot of sense uh, even if we get no funding from the federal government so uh, we think aquatic services are best delivered and certainly rationalized uh, through the university's new pool and let's be honest I mean, the provision of, of aquatic services is really expensive uh, and so to have the university's new pool uh, the uh, the 80 knox pool and the aquatic center downtown operating that close to one another it's difficult to rationalize all of us basically losing money at every pool to run that service. We're trying to rationalize it uh, and, and have it make sense. And they've been able to do that. And this has not been a, you know, sort of the flip of the switch decision. The, the work has been ongoing for a number of months, uh, frankly, through the pandemic uh, to try and carve out pathways that this could succeed. And the university has been a great partner uh, to make that happen. I'm very thankful for the leadership there uh, who seem fit to, to work to make this a success. But we do not need the federal funding uh, to move the pool. Uh, and what I'm saying here today is the federal funding will help accelerate the redevelopment in 80 Knox. Uh, but even if we do not get the federal funding, we need to redevelop 80 Knox and make it a community center. It'll just take us a little bit longer. So what would that look like then um, if you do not receive the funding, what would the reimagining look like and how long would you expect that to take? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have that entirely planned out because we're, we're really hoping we get the funding. Uh, but if you look at the elements that have been prepared in the, the rendering and the way that we sort of looked at the functional design uh, of the new AD Knox, we have some money set aside uh, today. Uh, we also have some money that we can uh, free up to be able to cover our portion of the share should we get the federal funding. Uh, it's the other portion that we would need to to work over time to get. Uh, but what I'm saying today is we're committed to doing that and there will be work starting regardless of what happens here. There will be work starting uh, on 80 Knox regardless of what happens with the federal uh, green fund. Thank you, Maureen. We'll go back once more to Brian Cross. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, can you um, talk about uh, the public input? Um, what are you hoping to get from them? You, you, you have sort of an outline of some of the, of the amenities you sort of see there. Are there other ideas that you're looking for? Or, you know, just you want people saying more tennis courts than, like, can you sort of explain what you're hoping from the public? Thanks for the question, Brian. So yeah, we want to get the public's input um, regarding this project. So we want to know if we offer programming or the program rooms, what do they want to see in those program rooms? Uh, what do they? What would be some barriers from the, for them to not want to go to a university pool? We want to make sure we address all of their concerns um, and to reassure them that we've basically uh, trying to accommodate them at the university pool to make sure they have all the amenities, all the same pricing as the, as the mayor mentioned, you know, complimentary parking and the programming all at the same time. So we want their feedback on the reimagined 80 knots. What do you guys want? What does the public want to see in this new one? Do you want to see basketball courts out, outdoors? Do you want to see tennis courts? Or do you want to see something else? Do, do you want the splash pad? Do you want the playground? We just want to hear from them to be able to uh, develop the vision that the, the community uh, wants to see as part of a new ADM. Thank you. I, I think it's fair to say that it's easy for us to draw lines on a page to say, here's where the basketball court would be. Uh, it would be more frustrating for us to draw those lines, build a basketball court and not have it used. Uh, and so if the public tells us that they want pickleball, then we'll make sure that, and we know it's gonna be used and, and we have a commitment, we're gonna build more pickleball. 
Uh, if they tell us they want, uh, you know, less of whatever else is on that drawing and a bigger uh, splash pad, then that's what we're going to do. Uh, and so we can tweak this to make sure we hit the mark because again, none of us want to see infrastructure facilities built that are that are underused. It's a waste of money and it just it, it, it makes the rest of the area look like an eyesore. So we want to make sure we hit the mark. Brian, thanks very much for the question. And all media members, thank you for participating today. Thanks, Mayor Dilkins, Dr. Gordon, Councillor Costante, and to our panelists and members of the media for joining us today. Later, a recording of this presentation will be posted to the city's Facebook page and YouTube channel. And a reminder that the city's public consultation survey will be open until June 15th and available in the survey section of citywindsor.ca. Thank you all and take care. Thanks, everyone.